Indeed, we are really bad at conflict in our society. Like, we're as bad as that together time, right? Did some of all that, it was a farce a little bit, but some of it felt familiar. Shaylin didn't want to even say that she was mad. That's, we have a hard time with conflict. Theoretically, cerebrally, we understand that conflict is a necessary part of being in relationship. We logically know that not everything is daisies and puppies when we're being in authentic relationship with each other. But oh, when it happens, or even worse, when it doesn't, like that example. And yes, I'm talking in society, but I'm also talking about us here at UUCP, because sometimes we deal badly with conflict when it comes up, and sometimes we just don't bring it up. I want to tell you the st a story about someone in this congregation. I have their permission to tell this story, but it's someone who had the bravery to have a tough conversation with me at the beginning of my ministry with you all here. This person specifically asked to talk with me after a Sunday. You see, they had put a sorrow in joys and sorrows. And instead of reading it all the way through, I started reading and it went words, words, words. And I said, yeah, yeah, we're gonna talk about that. Isn't that terrible? And I cut it off. and. My intent was to agree with their sorrow, but instead my impact is that I had cut off their words, dismissed what they had said, and put in my own instead. This person set up a time with me, expressed what I had done, had told me that it felt like their words and emotions weren't paid attention to when they were younger. They said they knew that I didn't intentionally do it, but that it had a negative consequence. And then they said the most direct and kindest words. I know it might not seem like a big deal, but our relationship is too important to me to not say something about it. It was the relationship that gave them the bravery, and believe me, it took a lot of bravery to deal with the conflict. What a gift, what a kind and honest and rare gift it was. But to be clear, it was also a risk for that person. I was their minister. I'm in a position of power. I could have gotten defensive. I could have gotten mad. I could have minimized it. All those things that I did to you, Shailen, when I stepped on your foot, I could have done all of those things. But they had the kindness and the bravery to express it so that we could be in a deeper relationship together. They had the courage to risk saying it so that we could understand each other more. It was a moment of conflict, yes, but it was also a great kindness that I will always treasure. So have you ever done that? Or are you just as likely to let it drop or hold it as a grudge, or wait until other things pile up and then just let it all come out at once and the person goes, whoa, where did that come from? We are continuing in our series on the characteristics of white supremacy culture as we live into our new eighth principle to journey towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. This month, we are talking about the specific characteristic of avoiding conflict and expecting to, to get comfort back. I have to tell you all, this is a big one when we're talking about race. It's really big mostly because we have to expect conflict when we are growing deeper in relationship, but especially when we are talking about race. For those who are black and brown, who know that there will be encounters about race, but also if there is going to be an honest connection between all of us, our black folks need to be able to feel safe saying, 
that was an ouch that you just did right there. That kind of hurt. And for those of us who are white, we need to be able to hear it. And not only be able to, but want to hear it, want to be in deeper relationship. After all, we all have the unique perspectives that we have in this world. We cannot be expected to know how another person feels. How can we know unless we are told? And how can we be told if we cannot receive it in love? And how can we not receive it if we are not accustomed to a society where our comfort is more important than those words and tools of relationship building? So let's break down this conflict and comfort a little bit. Let's start with the cultural assumption that we, and when I say we, I mean those of us with formal or informal power, however that manifests in your lives, that we have a right to comfort, which means that we don't tolerate conflict very well, especially open conflict. We are seeing this big time in the political right wing of our country right now. There is a massive backlash to talk about race. From Black Lives Matter to talking about race in our institutions, yes, I'm looking at you, critical race theory, and to talking about race or gender or sexual orientation in the classroom. Basically, the dominant culture does not want anything that will make them feel bad, right? They have an expectation that they should get to feel comfortable in any setting. And anyone who is making them think about inequities or challenging parts of our history, well, they are the problem. See, the right to comfort com not only means that we are resistant to conflict, but it also comes with a tendency to blame the person or group causing the discomfort or conflict rather than addressing the issues being named. This sometimes shows up as people in the dominant culture think white folks, heterosexuals, or neurotypical folks, equating any unfairness, perceived or real, that they may experience with racism or other forms of oppression. This is where the idea of reverse racism comes up. But it is not racism. That is a very well-defined and has been in this country for over 400 years. It's usually just someone not comfortable that they've been called out or feeling that someone is getting something that they feel that they are entitled to. So some of you might be sitting comfortably and going, yeah, that's what I've seen those conservatives do. They're bad, that's really bad. And if you think you're immune to it, I want you to look at your own hearts. Check your own hearts. Because part of dismantling racism is recognizing this culture in ourselves rather than only pointing it out in others. And believe me, they're making it very easy to point it out. <laughs> but it is our own internal work that we have to do as well. If you have been the target of conflict or criticism, racial or otherwise, have you ever found yourself getting defensive? Have you ever lumped people together who were causing you discomfort? Have you ever taken it personally, thinking you are a bad person, rather than looking for both the truth and the macro realities of our culture and our systems? I think this is a part of being human, part of being in this culture. The opportunity to be more anti-racist comes with acknowledging some deep truths not just cerebrally, but really practicing it every time conflict happens. There could be the truth that discomfort is at the root of all of our growth and learning. The ability to sit with that discomfort before responding and acting. The ability to understand that deeper analysis of racism and oppression so that you have a strong understanding of how your personal experience and feelings fit into that larger picture. 
basically, it's the epitome of saying, you know, it might not be about you. And looking to understand a different perspective, not only from the person that you're in conflict with, but within the larger systems at play. You don't always have to agree with the other perspective, but looking at it critically and compassionately is an awfully good place to start. Now, the example I pre presented at the beginning of this sermon was kind and gentle and compassionate feedback. It was conflict in that it was uncomfortable, but it was not open and aggressive at all. So let's step it up a notch, shall we? Let's talk about really open and in-your-face conflict. Let's talk about the conflict that may have raised voices with it or the standing up in your face kind of conflict. So basically, if the conflict we were talking about earlier makes us uncomfortable, well then this conflict just totally makes us downright squeamish, especially if the conflict is directed at those in power. When we see that kind of conflict, we are likely to name it as aggressive, and our flight response calls us to either ignore it or to run away from it as fast as we can. That is the kind of conflict we saw in Ferguson, Missouri, at the death of Mike Brown, and that we've seen countless times at the senseless murders of black folks at the hands of police. This is not polite conversation. This is literally black folks saying, stop killing us. It is the kind of open conflict that makes people so uncomfortable that they want to label Black Lives Matter's protests terrorists or enemies of the state. The response is to label the entire group as bad rather than looking at the issues that are actually causing the problem, which is that police officers are literally, brutally, and needlessly killing our black and brown siblings. And while that example is about riots, I invite us to think about conflict on a more local scale, a PTA meeting, a committee meeting, a congregational meeting. Those are all places where we can ideally support strong emotions and conflict and still be in relationship and community. The dislike of open conflict shows up in language like, well, we need order, or can't they find a more reasonable way to protest? It is asking people not to be angry at something that is totally reasonable to be angry about, like someone stepping on their foot intentionally and acknowledging that the anger often contains deep wisdom about where the underlying hurt or harm lies. We equate being openly angry with being impolite, rude, or out of line. And we label emotion as irrational or anti-intellectual or even inferior. We insist sometimes that our point of view is grounded in the rational and the intellectual when we are just masking our discomfort with reason and it means that we fail to recognize the importance of emotional intelligence. Now, we need to understand that there are laws and norms, and there also can be anger within that. And I'm inviting you into your discomfort around that. When you see someone really angry, I encourage you to distinguish between being polite and raising hard issues. And part of being anti-racist means not requiring those who are raising hard issues to raise them in acceptable ways, especially if they're the ways that are only acceptable to you and not acceptable to them. And especially if you are using the ways that the issues are raised as an excuse not to look at them. If I can be bold, and you know I will be anyway, <laughs> I think this congregation has an interesting relationship, maybe a wonky relationship with conflict. 
Now, we've been online for most of the time, so it's been kind of interesting to see how we deal with conflict in that time. And I've done a lot of listening of past conflicts um, of us all. And I can't tell you how many times that I've heard stories of being, someone being hurt or mad at someone. Sometimes it's me, but not wanting to cause waves, so they just let it go. Or more likely, they stew on it, or they tell other people, or they just leave. I've had some of you in my office asking me how to address a conflict in a group, not wanting to hurt someone's feelings. It's this idea that being in covenant with each other doesn't mean that we can't say, no, this is not right. And then, at some particularly memorable times in this congregation's history, it seems that all of the tension, all of the tension that is building just gets to a boiling point and explodes. And then there's lots of conflict. We've had lots of conflict about theism and humanism, about bathrooms, about the word evangelical, or about any number of issues. But I would argue that if we could learn how to do smaller doses of conflict, then we might not have to explode periodically. Let me tell you one more story. I have a new friend here in Phoenix. No, this is not about any of you, okay? She's somebody I respect and I like, and one that I value since the pandemic has meant that I haven't gotten to make as many friends as I'd like. But there was a problem. She had stood me up not just once, not just twice, three times. Now, one of those times she was in the hospital. It's really excusable, really. I'll give that to her. I'll give her a pass for that one. But there's still the feeling was that she didn't respect my time. And I was thinking that maybe this wasn't a friendship to develop for me. But then I remembered this. And I decided that this was a friendship worth being vulnerable for. So I told her, and she was horrified. She was incredibly apologetic, all to most to the point, like my, my together time, where I wish I hadn't said anything, and then I needed to comfort her and tell her it was OK. But here's what happened as a result. We became closer. We laugh more. We trust each other more. And you can bet she hasn't stood me up anymore. <laughs> I was brave enough to say something, and as a result, we got closer. Conflict can work like that. I urge you to think of conflict and actively engage in it as a critical anti-racist tool. Because the antidote to white supremacy culture is the deep connection that comes with beloved community. And we cannot get to deep connection unless we are willing to go through deep conflict. It matters that we have conflict. And it matters how we do conflict. It matters that we are brave and kind and direct and compassionate. It matters creating the beloved community in this congregation and in the wider world is counting on us being able to do it. Let's do it together.